So our system asks that essentially, how do you feel? How much did you sleep last night? How's your diet been over the last 24 hours? How is your mood today? How is your soreness? How is your energy and motivation to train today? And in the same way that you would adjust your athlete's training by their responses to those things, we adjust in our artificial intelligence system. So it's, it's just systematizing coaching logic on a very grand scale. Welcome to the Art of Coaching Podcast, a show aimed at getting to the core of what it takes to change attitudes, behaviors, and outcomes in the weight room, boardroom, classroom, and everywhere in between. I'm your host, Brett Bartholomew. I'm a performance coach, keynote speaker, and the author of the book, Conscious Coaching. But most importantly, I'm a lifelong student interested in all aspects of human behavior and communication. I want to thank you for joining me. And now let's dive into today's episode. Hey everyone, nice to have you back. This is an episode that the training nerds amongst you will enjoy. I'm here with Chad Wesley Smith, who's the owner and founder of Juggernaut Training Systems. And Chad is also one of the most highly regarded strength coaches and athletes of the modern era. Now, what does that mean? Listen, these numbers will put it to context. As an athlete, Chad has posted top 10 all-time total in powerlifting of 1,055 kilograms. And for those of you that are not used to that conversion, that is 2,325 pounds. Yes, this individual has lifted in total 2,325 pounds in competition. And in sleeves, which we'll talk to you about what that means for those of you that aren't initiated into this, 2,226 pounds. He's won two national championships in the shot put and earned his pro card in strongman. And as a coach, he's helped cultivate the talents of some of the world's strongest raw power lifters, NFL players, champions in MMA and Brazilian jiu-jitsu, Olympians in track and field. You get the idea. Why did I want to have Chad on? Simple. He's a guy that I've interacted with plenty in real life. He's always very thoughtful, intentional. He is a person that is never going to give you you know, just this run of the mill answer, he likes to go deep. And I'll admit it, we get a little bit nerdy in this episode. But the thing that fascinated me about him, and if you followed me for a while, it's simple, guys. We see a lot of people from a lot of different fields cross over, but very rarely, and yes, I have a chip on my shoulder about this because I'm proud of, of, you know, my base and the world that I started out in. Strength coaches haven't always done that. In the strength and conditioning world or human performance, you have people that have to deal with a wide range of variables, scientific principles and people. But not a lot of them ever make it past the coaching phase into becoming entrepreneurs or or speaking. It's very much a just keep your head down and grind it out kind of field. But Chad is a different kind of thinker, and he's gone on to build a really successful business. He does online training that utilizes artificial intelligence to help create programs for men and women all around the world. He's found a way to brand himself ethically without being loud or contentious, and I'm just always fascinated in that. And you'll hear it in his voice. He's not bombastic, he's not overpowering, but this is a large, strong man who also has large, strong values and keeps those home and hearth of everything that he does. So I can't wait for you to get to know him, and I think you'll especially like where this conversation goes in the later parts of the episode. Also, I wanna give a shout out to our sponsor, Saga Fitness, which you can learn more about at saga.fitness. Listen, they're the creators of the BFR cuffs that I used to get through my shoulder surgery and to be able to recover and regain the muscle size that I had lost after atrophying. Now, what are these cuffs for those of you that, you know, this term's new and what's BFR? Blood flow restriction, simply put, involves placing a tourniquet around, it could be your arm or your leg during exercise, which restricts blood flow from the working muscle. I know that sounds dangerous, relax. There's tons of research on this. And the best thing about their cuffs is they actually use smart technology to help you understand what is the right pressure for you, how to keep this safe. All in all, guys, what this allows for when you use their cuffs and they guide you through every step of the way is it helps you get a cascade of physiological benefits from muscle strength, muscle size, even better 
conditioning. It's a different way to challenge yourself during these workouts. And when travel opens back up and we all find ourselves in crappy hotel gyms again, where there's barely any weights or what do you know, all the equipment's taken. These things can intensify your body weight training. They can intensify your performance training. They can intensify a lot of different things and it's taken the guesswork out of it. I will continue to give more details as we go, but given the training base nature of this episode, I really wanted to point you to it. And Brett 20, B-R-E-T-T 20 will get you 20% off anything they have over at Saga.Fitness. So check them out. If you are somebody that appreciates efficiency and safety in your workouts, but you're looking for a different challenge, I think you're going to love them a lot. All right. On to Chad Wesley Smith. Chad Wesley Smith, welcome to the show, buddy. Brett, thanks for having me. Yeah, the last time I saw you, we were in California, and the time before that, you interviewed me in my uh, my kitchen. Yes, yes. We, we, always, we always seem to meet. It's interesting, man. Like, you're one of those guys that if I see in a crowd, I always make a mental note. I'm like, all right, I got to make time to go chat with him. Yet our paths never cross that often, man. And, and it's tricky because, like, you're everywhere. You balance a lot of plates. You do a lot of different things. At the same time, I feel like you found a really good rhythm in your life and found some simplicity in, in all the success. Well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, talk to me a little bit about, you know, so much of our audience relates to this idea of wanting to do more in terms of, you know, they say that they lay their head down at night and it's like, hey, am I making the impact I really want to do? Like, am I, am I doing this the right way? Whatever the hell the right way means, right? Like, you're somebody that's evolved a good bit in your career and we've gone over your intro on, on the beginning. So guys, if you're the type of listeners that you fast forward through that, make sure you go and listen to Chad's background. But how have you kind of managed, not just the stuff that you've had to adapt to in COVID, I think you were already pretty well set up for that, but like navigating from just being from the strength world to all other aspects of your business. Can you talk to us a little bit about when, when that switch occurred for you and what were some of the early lessons on that front? Yeah, I mean, from just a pure coaching standpoint, I think most people know me as a powerlifter or a powerlifting coach. Uh, so especially these last couple of years as I'm doing sport performance coaching, I, I could kind of see a couple you know, weird looks from people like, why, why, why do we have the powerlifter uh, you know, on that first day or, or whatever from having a, a football coach or someone have that reaction? But that's my real background is sport performance coaching, you know, track and field in college and all that stuff. So from just a pure coaching standpoint, you know, I've, I've taken really this, this lifetime uh, of experience through track and field coaching, football coaching, competing uh, at the collegiate level in track and field, powerlifting, strongman, jujitsu, you know, all the people that I've gotten to encounter and kind of being uh, early relatively, I guess, in the, the online fitness world uh, on, on more of the, the strength side of things that's, that's gotten up opened me up to so many more, um, opportunities. Uh, I think, you know, just being early to market type of stuff with, with that, uh, side of things to the work that we're doing now, uh, with artificial intelligence coaching and, and bringing, you know, the, the highest level of individualized program design to, you know, as many people as possible. And for those of you guys that are listening that, you know, if your background isn't in performance or what have you, I mean, getting the idea of, understand what we talk about with program design, right? Like it's a roadmap to make sure that you're hitting your goals from a fitness or performance standpoint. But like when you say artificial intelligence, right? I think people are used to the idea of, Hey, I have this coach and I pay him to write my programs or, Hey, I go somewhere. And I'm talking about the average Joe, right? Like they have people that they consult with. Maybe they're, they're getting online. Maybe they just went to a gym before COVID, what have you. When you say artificial intelligence and, and everything you're doing with your app and online program to help people actually get no bullshit training. Like walk me through that. Like what the hell do you know about artificial intelligence, Chad? And I answer that with this. I asked that with a smile on my face. Yeah. Uh, well, so I'm not the person who does that. I'm, I'm, you know, I talk the lifting and then, uh, fortunately we have a good translator in that, uh, our, our main, yeah, the developer of our, our patent pending system, Skynet, uh, Skynet. World War- a world record holder in powerlifting as well as doing the coding side of things. So he could translate my, my meathead talk into the computer talk. Yeah. But, <laughs> uh, you know, so what we have is an expert system, uh, artificial intelligence. So taking the logic of an expert in a field, me in uh, powerlifting coaching, and basically just looking at 
every potential decision uh, because even you know when people talk about the the art of coaching uh, and not not necessarily in the sense that that you use it but like these intuitive decisions of all right this person needs to do this much more that much less or whatever it is uh, all of that is is just a logical process whether the coach realizes it or not um, that is built upon these principles of of training and and you know that's the thing that maybe some coaches realize are, yeah. or they don't or they they don't actually have a principle based system uh, but kind of everything that ours is is built on the reason that I wanted to create it is uh, I was so frustrated with, with a system that I really contributed to, you know, I wrote the juggernaut method in 2010. That was one of very few at the time, kind of five, three, one starting strength of these like, you know, named programs. And, and you were going to do this fixed sets and rep scheme. And now, you know, uh, 11 years later, I see people still doing even, even the juggernaut method. I, I it's like, I hate the juggernaut method. Now, not that it's a bad program, but I hate the idea that you just get typecasted by your first, whatever your first work was or something that's early on people associate you with that thing. Uh, I, I hate that it, it contributes to people, to coaches and athletes having a simplistic understanding of the way that training works, mm. that they think if you and I right, both download the same program from the internet, we do the same sets and reps. And I, if I got it 10 years years ago versus where I'm at in my, my training career. Now it's the same thing, but we don't have the same needs. And, you know, uh, my, my girlfriend, Marissa is, is five time national champion powerlifter, five foot tall, 115 pounds, 44 years old. And if people would look at her and I they think, why, you know, why would those two people do the same, the same program? But every day there's thousands and thousands of athletes, you know, just doing this cookie cutter stuff and coaches, you know, pushing that forward, whether it's because they lack the understanding, the depth of understanding necessary to individualize training, or they, it's just better for their business to be like, yes, everyone do my, you know, 12 week, this program. Uh, and it's really, it frustrates me because it does a disservice to people. So basically what we did was take my coaching logic of how does training need to change because man or woman big, small, heavy, light, short, uh, tall, experienced, beginner, strong, weak, lifestyle factors, all that stuff, because all of it is making these micro adjustments. And then as the training goes on, do you slept bad? You know, if, if as a athlete walks into your gym and you're like, you know, how do you feel? And, and you know, a question that I know is, it seems so simple, but but someone like you understands it needs to be taken seriously every day. It's not just, oh, feel good, coach. Yeah. You know, but, but you're trying to get a real response there. So our system asks that essentially, how do you feel? How much did you sleep last night? How's your diet been over the last 24 hours? How is your mood today? How is your soreness? How is your energy and motivation to train today? And in the same way that you would adjust your athletes training by their responses to those things, we adjust in our artificial intelligence system. So it's it's just systematizing coaching logic on a very grand scale. Yeah. And being able to individualize it, you know, in, in economies of scale, which is a smart thing. I think uh, the, the thing that's always confounded me and I, and you and I talked about this when you interviewed me is how even some coaches, and this kind of leads to an ideology. And of course I'm not talking to everybody here, but some, some coaches I feel like over the years I've just learned are lazy, right? Like they, they don't want to apply much individual, they don't want to apply any of this kind of individualized uh, techniques to training. Cause like you said, it's just easier for them to kind of click, 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 but also like the interaction right within the context of how we use art of coaching. And I would imagine you've got to get some of the same excuses I did where when I'd go present or talk about my book, people would say, well, I don't have time to do this. You know, I got this many athletes. I got a hundred athletes. I can't, I'm like, and you can't really like get to know them so that you can understand the variables that might impact the conversations you have with them you know, what are some of the excuses that you've seen and that you still seem to be super pervasive, even amongst, you know, people that are perceived to be pretty high level of like, well, I, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to lean on that, or I don't want to do it that way. Like what kind of excuses are people coming up with? that still tend to drive you nuts after all the years that you've been in this field. Yeah. So I, I always wonder when, when people do respond with that type of excuse, are they doing it actually because of that excuse or is it a lack of understanding? 
Like it's, it's one thing to not make the adjustments because you understand they need to be made and you just don't want to do it. Yeah. And then there's another point that you just don't understand that they need to be made. I'm not really sure which one is worse. Yeah. Um, that both that, <laughs> both that options. No doubt. Uh, yeah. I, I think particularly in my world of where I exist, you know, the most powerlifting and weightlifting that it is such this hard, you know, old school, hardcore kind of mentality. And they're, they're trying to take, you know, round pegs and put them into square holes or vice versa. Um, but it's, it's like a my way or the highway kind of thing. So if the athlete's not adapting to, to the way that they want to do it, then well, then that athlete just not cut out for success, uh, you know, in this, in this field, that, that's probably the, the one I see the most in, in powerlifting or it's, it's, and there's sometimes where this could be accurate, but they're putting, you know, the fault more on the, on the athlete for not doing the, the things that they need to do. And, and there are certainly times where, where that is the, that is the case, but at some point, if it's consistently happening as well, why aren't I getting the athletes to do those things that they, they need to do? Is there a different way I need to communicate it? Is there a different way I need to motivate, you know, them towards it? But yeah, it's, it's funny how they always have a uh, coaches will look at athletes and this happened the other day. I don't think I've shared this on the air. Somebody sent me a picture of an NFL wide receiver who they're being held up by their legs. Like you would do for a human wheelbarrow. Right. And they're tapping on these lights and they're like, Oh, the post was an athlete saying they're working on hand speed, which we all know is like, that's okay, whatever. But this coach said, you know, I can't believe this. Why do you think people do this? And I said, Hey man, like, do you think there's anything that you're doing in your life that you're kind of stubborn about that you just keep going back to the well on again and again and again and again, because you think it's giving you an edge, but really it's kind of allowing you to stay in a place of stagnation. And they're like, well, what do you mean? And you know, after we kind of uncovered a little bit of it, guy kind of talked about how he always kind of went to the same conferences, always bought the same kind of, you know, he owned about 80 books on periodization program design. And he's like, the point is, is people gravitate to what's easy for him. You know, they gravitate to what's easy. It doesn't want to be done. And, but like what, what, baffles me. And I wonder if you've experienced this yourself. Cause I always say like, I'll make fun of myself just as much as you give a hard time to somebody else or had to be a time in your career. What baffles me is when people, uh, like almost get rid of this memory where it's like, yeah, you've done this too. You know, you've chased this rabbit in some area of your life. It may not be your craft or your coaching or what have you, but in some area you've played it safe and you were really just kind of hiding from the thing that you needed to do and, and using a different solution. Have you had any of that? Like, you know, just in, whether it's your relationship, whether it's business oriented, what, what were some holes that you had to get yourself out of these ruts to that you were falling victim to the same bias, so to speak, that some of these folks can. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's just such an easy thing now to get caught in like an echo chamber, whether it's, it's in, through social media because it, it shows you, you know, it's designed to show you the stuff that you like, or it's, you know, kind of surrounding yourself with only like-minded people and which is going to turn into like a yes man kind of situation. And, and especially when it's being relatively successful, people want to, you know, attach themselves to that and tell you, yeah, this is the best way to do it. We're doing it the best. They're doing it wrong where it's uncomfortable to, to have decisions you know, to have to, to have to make decisions that are changes or to have conversations with people who are opposing you. And, uh, you know, I, I definitely find myself in, in that, in a coaching situation, not as, not as much now, um, as younger in my coaching career, like there was a, a time where people would say, Oh, we were, we were so divisive in the way that we approached, uh, coaching. Cause we were the only people who said like that West side, wasn't the best thing ever in the world in powerlifting. I remember that. And, yeah. And, uh, you know, so it, it then just became like an us versus them. But something I try and do now is to constantly be introspective and, and to often challenge, you know, read things that I don't agree with to try and find something of, of value that I can take from that. And, and that's, I think just a, a self-awareness thing that people need to have, but is if they're constantly, being introspective and trying to innovate from that introspection, looking, you know, what is, you know, no one's doing it perfect. So there's always going to be something that we can find. And rather than looking at the people who are doing, doing it differently and just, I don't like the way they're, they're doing it or people who are your competition. I find this very, very often with our, you know, weightlifting teams we're competitive with it. It's easy to be like, Oh, you know, F those guys. Like, but they're doing something right. They're, they're, doing well. So even though I might not like most of what they're doing, what is one thing 
that we can look at and emulate of theirs or adapt to, to our own practices. Yeah. I mean, being able to, at some point, intelligence is hallmarked uh, by being able to normalize for failure, you know, as you get older with some things. And I remember one time I was asked, uh, you know, what's one thing, this is when I went and spoke for an organization that was not in performance and they were trying to learn more about the strength and conditioning industry. And they said, what's one thing that I should know about the field that you came from and what's something that I'd be surprised to know? And I thought that was a good question. And I said, you know, one thing you should know is that a lot of people in human performance, regardless, former power lifters, weight lifters, you know, strength coaches in pro college, high school, whatever, is they know just as more, much about leadership, if not more than, than people that are in fortune 500 boardrooms and, and what have you, like, it's a lot of different variables. I go, here's the rub. The thing that you might be surprised to know is a lot of them are super insecure and that keeps them from being good at enacting what they know. And they said, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, listen, like a lot of big, strong males, females, this, that agile, uh, athletic, whatever term you want to use. But a lot of people got into their field or their chosen sport, you know, because yeah, of course they were competitive and there could be a social component. But if people got into things that were lifting centric, you know, a lot of times people in strength and conditioning got into it just because, uh, you know, they wanted to be better than they were. You know, and I think sometimes that's the issue is they can let passion cloud their judgment and they're very good at telling everybody else to get out of their comfort zone, but then they're not themselves and they think they are because they'll train hard, they'll get under load, they'll do these things or stress themselves physiologically, but that's not really hard for them. That's the shit that they like doing. You know, you've, on the other hand, stretched yourself in a major sense from a business standpoint. You brand yourself ethically. You stayed away from BS. I mean, I know we all do stuff that eventually we're like, oh, we wish we had that graphic back or this back. Uh, when, when was a big growth period for you in terms of not how to just conduct yourself as a coach, but as a professional, right? Like as, as, as a, a ethical version of a brand, so to speak. Yeah. You know, so, so as we started putting a lot more content online, in about 2012, late, late 2012 is when I started to make a shift from almost entirely in-person coaching to the majority of our work being, being done online. And that I think also kind of coincided with the, the initial parts of, you know, online fitness growth. So I got to see so many more people do it, do it wrong, you know, and, uh, almost two, two years ago now we had our or, or a year and a half ago, we had our 10th anniversary party for Juggernaut. Congratulations. And thank you. And, you know, as I was giving my, my little toast kind of speech to it, I, I said that the most, the thing I'm most proud of is that we're always trying to do it right. We're always trying to do it right from the sense of principle-based information of, you know, when there are things that caveats can be made of or asterisks could be next to, we're disclosing what those, what those are for people. Um, so I think for me, it was, it was really a, a thing that became, came through, uh, because of powerlifting, because in powerlifting, there's equipped powerlifting and, and raw powerlifting. And I was so like, honestly, morally opposed to the idea of equipped powerlifting. I was like, these people are cheating and not that the sport was cheating, but the people who were promoting it to promote their training means we're saying, oh, we lifted, we squatted this much and benched this much, but they didn't mention the special suits that they were wearing. I was yeah, like, I was going to say, for our audience that isn't familiar with the term, if you wouldn't mind just giving a super, super quick idea so they, they can contrast the two between equipped and non-equipped. Yeah, so imagine uh, if you put four wetsuits on that were four, three, two, and one size too small, <laughs> and then you did a squat. You wouldn't even be able to squat down, but if you were able to squat down, it would stand you up with a lot of assistance. That's, it's just a, a supportive equipment that's helping you lift more. It's within yep. the rules of it, but significantly more like someone who benches 600 could now bench a thousand right. with practice. Um, so when I saw that happening, I was, I was just like, this, they're, they're lying. Like, and that was I mean, like the first moment where I was like, we have to be as transparent and upfront about the way we're doing everything because that was such a frustrating idea to me for, for something that I held so you know dear and personal, like that sport that I was competing in. Uh, so that, that was really a, a, honestly a big piece of it. And then, you know, you just see so much BS in, in the way things are, are marketed down to something as simple as, again, in, in the powerlifting and weightlifting world, people using the, the term nationally ranked. We train thousands of nationally ranked athletes. Every athlete you train in powerlifting and weightlifting, if they've done a competition, is nationally ranked. They might be nationally ranked 10,000. <laughs> it's like, right. 
you know, the, the use, the like kind of creative use of even language and stuff like that, that, that was always just very frustrating to me. And we've probably done ourselves a disservice from a pure marketing standpoint because, you know, we, we would say a national level lifter because our lifter got fourth, not a medalist. Yeah. You know, instead of a national medalist kind of thing, the, uh, where, where I've probably gone too much in the opposite direction, but, you know, I'd, I'd see these, these companies who were doing things that, you know, were in a cloudy ethical area, uh, for me or, or using athletes who, you know, they didn't actually compete in the sport because they wouldn't be able to pass the drug test, but they, you know, put the appearance of competing because they're doing all the training yeah, and things like that. And, and I saw these companies get really big and they're selling tons of t-shirts or whatever it is that they, they do. And at some point I just realized, you know, what we do, which is, you know, just at its heart, trying to provide tools for athletes and coaches to reach their goals, whether that's education tools, coaching, whatever, um, <clears throat> that might never be like the sexiest thing, mm -hmm. but you know, it's, it's going to be useful now. It's going to be useful in 10 years, it's perennial, years, however long I want to do this Yeah. or some of these other ones, they're going to, they might, you know, burn hot for a second, but commodities because there's no substance to it. Yeah. No, but I, and that, I think that's a lot of where I related to when I, uh, you know, cause we didn't meet till relatively late later in my career and what have you. And, and even now, and you've been around a long time, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting trying to sell people something that's perennial versus a commodity. You know, it's, it's when people say, Hey, you could do, uh, get more followers by doing this and that it's like, yeah, but we're selling communication and coaching and, and actually the messy realities of leadership. We're not doing that. Just like you're not sharing, you know, your goal isn't to share some version of unethical BS just so you, people can see like, wow, look at that tremendous feat of strength. I mean, it blows people's mind to see what pe the human body is capable of in general. There there's, there's better ways to do that than have to go to these extremes. And not like that, when you go to those extremes, you're going to get stuck in a rabbit hole of having to do that pervasively. You know what I mean? Then, then that becomes the brand identity of, of your business and your organization. And all of a sudden you've eroded what juggernaut was because what you wanted to spike in rankings or you wanted a little bit more traffic or you wanted a little bit. And that's the tricky thing in this field, man. Like, uh, I was telling a previous guest just, uh, just a few days ago, or it'll be a couple of weeks by the time you were, this episode goes live. I got a death threat for not showing something that this guy wanted to see on Instagram that, you know, guys were doing accentuated drops off of a box and they were using, you know, 20 pound, it was about 20% of their body weight, this, that, whatever. We had already progressed to going to higher boxes with body weight, what have you. This was one snippet, maybe week six of eight, right. Of a progression that we had done. And this guy, and it's always the dudes with like no followers, no posts, you know, all black avatar says, you know, I can't believe you, you, promote yourself as an expert in the field. Everybody knows you should go up and box height with body weight before you add load. And you try to be nice. You're like, Hey man, uh, understood. You're right. I'm going to, I'm going to validate you right there. You're right. However, you're taking this out of context. This, that was done prior. And the guy comes back and goes, well, why didn't you show a video of that? And I was just like, excuse me, you know, cause my page isn't the purpose of my page is not to show training, just like the purpose of your page isn't to show a bunch of drugged up lifters doing things that like they're not smart training isn't actually responsible for. And uh, he's, he just basically went on to say that I should be showing all of these things along the way, which I thought was crazy. And then it led to a death threat. And I'm like, well, why don't you share something? He shared in DMs a picture of a gun and made a threat. And I'm just like, what world do we live in? We're like, now there's a big reason why I don't just show training content it brings a lot of weird folks out of the woodwork because they want to be heard. They want to be the expert. They want to be this, which is another thing I admire about you, Chad. Like you were like the picture of equanimity, man. I've never seen you like riled up or losing your shit. You've never, and I'm sure there's a time and place, right? Happened. Yeah, man. But like you have a very unique personality in that. And I'd be interested to hear how you describe yourself when people think what is a successful coach or a business owner or to be able to have a personality or a brand, people get these conceptions in their mind yet, you know, you speak at a certain cadence, you have a certain pace, you're very pragmatic, you know, you're, you're not all over the place and, and you've found a good rhythm with what you do. How, it, how has that all kind of been accustomed with the groove of, of finding your business and everything that you do? So you don't invite the wackadoos into your life. Uh, you know, I think once I got far enough into it, I realized it was just a waste of energy to, yeah. to deal with <laughs> with a lot of that. 
Um, powerlifting, and I'm sure every every sport, but powerlifting I think attracts a particularly a particularly crazy, a, a particular brand of crazy. Uh, so I was having, yeah, you know, I've had plenty of internet arguments and in-person arguments about the best way to to train, you know, to put a piece of metal on your back and bend your knees and stand up. Uh, and then I was just like, why, why am I lending any of my energy to, to that? Um, you know, as far as far as that developing, I think that just came with with age and and maturity. I started juggernaut. I uh, started writing the business plan for Juggernaut when I was 22 years old. That's what I was going to ask. 22. And how old are you now for context for the audience? Uh, I'll turn 35 in July. 35. Yeah. So, yeah, it was straight out, straight out of college. It was my first it was my first real job. I mean, I, I prior to that had been a newspaper delivery boy uh, when I was like 12 and uh, worked, worked at a restaurant for six months and coached high school football and high school track for a couple of years. But uh, you know, I've only had four jobs. I, I really only foresee myself having four jobs ever. Uh, even though I guess what I do now is splintering off into into different, you know, veins. But but uh, yeah, at, at some point I just realized I was like, you know, I can't control people's reactions to things, and and why would I give them any of my energy with with a reaction that they're trying to elicit? Yeah. Crazy comes in all kinds of flavors. I've always thought it's a good social experiment when, uh, and I, I make this comparison a lot. So a lot of like lifetime listeners will be like, Oh, here he goes again. But, uh, I follow a couple of people that are dentists that I've met throughout my life. And it's funny. They can show an image of removing a molar and nobody in the comments is like, well, what you don't do incisors, you know? And like, <laughs> and so I think it's, again, it's a, it's a very interesting social experiment within that. That's made you have to, you know, you have to look at yourself a lot with these, with these things and make sure that you're not feeding into it. So you, you did this, uh, this is going to be a general question and kind of hot seat question, but just take it as it comes. You mentioned you only anticipate having four jobs. Do you think more coaches, uh, whether team setting this, that, whatever, do you think more of them need to embrace entrepreneurial routes, given the state of things that we've seen with COVID, given the state of, you know, short contracts, all these things, like, do you think more coaches should embrace entrepreneurship? Uh, if, if, if that's the the route that they they want to have, you know, pe- people always ask me if if I wanted to be an NFL strength coach or something like that, and I think people on the outside's perception is that an NFL strength coach is a much better, more prestigious job than what I do. But I, you know, I have many very good friends who are NFL strength coaches who I think would much prefer to do what I do. Hey guys, wanted to take a minute just to remind you, we're talking about apps, we're talking about technology, we're talking about coaching here. If you have not yet checked out everything that we do with our channels app, which is for business owners, which is for teachers, which is for coaches, which is for people, you have to get to artofcoaching.com forward slash channels. It is my direct, personalized, no frills way to be able to interact with you guys more candidly. Every week, I drop new content I'm not sharing anywhere else. We have Q&A, town hall discussions, all these different things, and we have professionals from every field, which is what Art of Coaching is about, talking about these things. So if you have trouble with assertiveness, if you have trouble with word choice, if you have trouble understanding what to charge for your services, if you have trouble with anything that falls under communication and the messy realities of leadership, please get over there. There's no social media. There's no convoluted sign in. There's no huge membership site. It is literally an app where you can point and shoot, whether you got your kids in your hands, whether you're making dinner, it just allows us to connect face to face in a campfire chat kind of way. Go to artofcoaching.com forward slash channels to learn more. Looking forward to seeing you there. All right, back to chat. And I think people on the outside's perception is that an NFL strength coach is a much better, more prestigious job than what I do. But I, you know, I have many very good friends who are NFL strength coaches who I think would much prefer to do what I do. Uh, so, so that's all sort of in the eye of the beholder. Not everyone is is cut out to to be their own boss. There are some people who are who are not going to succeed as entrepreneurs. They should probably not try and be entrepreneurs because they will find themselves unemployed then. Um, but for me, it, it, it's the only it's the only route. I mean, even when I I started coaching high school football when I was 19 and could barely, you know, take our head coaches' orders, you know, from from time to time. I just don't 
fulfill that role very well as as employee. Um, you know, from from the I guess the broader sense of of understanding small business ownership and and all the other parts that can help a coach be, you know, t- turn it into a career in terms of like taking other take you know understanding the the other financial aspects of it whether it's investing retirement all, all that type of stuff yeah that's something I wish I would have learned a lot sooner because I think there's there's people grinding away at their at their training business or their their small you know studio gym or whatever it is and they have really no long term plan because there's no scalability so while focusing on you know their craft of coaching is you know, extremely important. And I want every coach to be doing as good a job of, of that part of things as, as possible and not just become complacent and, well, I'm coaching well enough. So now I'm just going to learn all about marketing or, or whatever it is. Um, there are a lot of people who they're only focused, like they're not even focusing on the coaching part because they're not that good of coaches and they don't have any business sense <laughs> about that. Yeah. So I'm right, becoming well-rounded because when I got into this, I just thought, all right, you know, in the morning, I'm going to train MMA fighters and in the afternoon, I'm going to train football players and, and we're going to, you know, post all these badass videos on YouTube. Like, like Joe DeFranco was like our biggest inspiration starting up. And yeah, I thought that's all it was. And then I found out about marketing and accounting and, you know, cleaning bathrooms and all the other bullshit that came, came along with it. Um, so yeah, I think, I think coaches finding that, that balance for them, if, being an entrepreneur and being their own boss is, is what they want, which for me is, is the only way. Yeah. There are things that I miss about that setting sometimes, but just not all the time. Like uh, one of my buddies just went from assistant strength coach at the 49ers to the head strength coach at the Jets. So I told the head coach, I was like, all right, I guess uh, this is the time. I got to tell you though, in advance, I don't work every day of the week and I'm very expensive. So just be forewarned. Uh, and, and, you know, he didn't give me the job off of that off of that uh, description. No. Yeah, it's fun fun now to just kind of drop in and do the consulting stuff for a couple of days here and there. Yeah, no, I agree. I think uh, one thing I wanted to ask you, just especially because of your expertise of being able to coach athletes across a wide variety of sports and the different ways in which you've you've tested yourself as a communicator, right? You've written a good bit. You do everything on social media. You're out in front, like just like you said, you'll, you'll coach and you'll consult. How, how would you describe, and I want to make sure I ask this in a way that, that makes sense. How, if somebody's coaching you and I give a shit if it's business, I give whatever it is, how do you want to be coached? You know, what's the way you like to be spoken to? What, 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 how, how can somebody best get you to buy into something that maybe you inherently either don't know about, aren't sure about what have you feel free to take that anywhere within that domain of what you've learned about yourself from not just a coach standpoint, but being coached and being led or guided. That's, that's a good question. You know, that there's so few times in my life where I've been coached recently from an athletic standpoint. Last year, I started, uh, well, I guess, two years ago now, because I'm in the COVID time vortex. Um, I started being coached in wrestling to help my jujitsu. And by one of the most intense coaches I've ever encountered, a guy named Jacob Harmon. And this is, you know, first, first day, this guy had coached all American wrestlers, UFC fighters. And we're training and I am dying, dying from a conditioning standpoint. And he's, you know, he's not quite as big as me. Jacob's about 5'8", 270. And, uh, you know, he's on me like a bulldog and yelling at me. And it, it was like this very uh, different. I was like, I don't know that I've really ever had a coach yell at me because they never had to when I was in high school or college or anything. I just went about and did it. But uh, as intense as he was in the moment, yeah, he was doing a great job, really just describing the the why of, you know, why we were going to do each thing that we we're going to do. And as long as I had that understanding uh, going into it, I could have a complete buy-in. And then I was just like, this is just this guy's personality. And I kind of loved it uh, as well. He, he was pretty awesome in that sense. Um, so the other area where I'm, where I'm, you know, have a lot of coaching now is dealing with like tax planners or financial planning something that I had no, no understanding of ever. So I I really appreciate when those guys can bring the same idea that I try and bring in coaching powerlifting is principle based, you know, help me understand the the overarching systems that we're going to 
deal with here. And, you know, if I can understand that, that big why behind things, then I'm all in going, going for it. But I much prefer, you know, the, the big picture 10,000 foot kind of view than people who are trying to be overly granular. Yeah. Global instead of just overly analytical, right? It's, um, it's interesting that you say that, you know, we, we were doing some research when we were talking about a presentation that talks about people in science-based fields, which, you know, you and I, that's a lot of what we came up in is, uh, of course, we like the why we like the rationality. We like those things, but then it, it's interesting when you look at emergent research talking about how so often people get bought into something because of, you know, subconscious stuff, right? There's always, there's always something and that research can show, Hey, somebody with a square jaw is more believable than somebody with a rounder face. Right. And, and people's perceptions of leaders or what have you, do you ever find, and feel free to like take a moment here. If you have to think about a dead air is okay. Do you ever find that there's something silly? Sometimes it makes you more likely to, to buy into something. You know, of course you like the facts and the rationality and the why, but is there something else that might be part of your collective subconscious working that you tend to be more trustworthy of this kind of person that even if it's a faulty heuristic that you've got to pay attention to there or feel free to tell a story about something maybe that with Marissa or an athlete you've coached. Yeah. You know, as far as something that's outside of that really the kind of logical system yeah. for me, I, I have a hard time finding one of those things. Because if I realized that it was outside of that system, I probably wouldn't, wouldn't be <laughs> yeah. doing it. Uh, I'm sure that there is something that is in a, a blind spot that I'm that I'm not picking up on. That that's an area where I, you know I, I struggle a lot in the aspect of our business of, of like marketing and that kind of things because I see the stuff that's really popular and I, I'm just like I don't. Under- I'm with I'm with <laughs> I'm with you. Like, I understand what they're doing. And that is what is appealing to you, but I don't understand why that is appealing. So I, I can't like recreate uh, the, the same thing, but and I'm a, a bit of a loss. For, no, that's for fine. I think what, what you hit on is a good thing that kind of comes back to the beginning when we talked about AI, because the algorithms on social media can mess with you to that degree as well, right? Like there's things that I'll even mess around with where I know that I posted when I had 30,000 fewer followers and I don't repeat much content, I probably should do more because I always forget that more people follow you and follow you and they've never seen the stuff that you did in 2017, you know? And, um, but then I'll repost it and sometimes it'll get way higher engagement. Sometimes it's abysmally low and then it starts making you think. And then you look at other people's stuff. Like I know one guy who's an organizational psychologist that he abides by none of the rules on Instagram, right? Everything is just a Twitter screenshot, which I get why that can do well. Cause it seems like an official statement. Like I do that as well. Um, but there's no engagement, no interaction with any of his audience and it'll just get tens and thousands and tens and thousands of likes and views. And, and there's no personal connection there. And we see this with musicians as well. And it kind of goes back to the importance of just doing the work. There's musicians that won't put out al- albums for four to five years that have millions of followers or can put out an aberrant kind of tweet or what have you. And it just blows up. And it's, it's a fine line because what, what it always, what'd you say? Like Daniel Day Lewis, just make it one movie every like six years, Oscar every time. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And so like, that's the only respite I've taken from some of this stuff is like, I'm like, all right, like, listen, if you get too caught up in it, just go back to the work. Cause if the works quality, other things, but, um, I've noticed that one thing that we were talking about recently is people sometimes that seem a little bit scatterbrained in the past, usually weren't looked at kind of as these authority figures, right? If they're scatterbrained, couldn't choose their words carefully, uh, I don't know. But now you have people like Elon Musk, right? And I love Elon Musk, but I think Elon Musk would even admit, not a great orator. But you have people that can kind of, you know, they're trying to find the right words. They're always going to have a lot of vocal fillers. And they can be looked at as, oh, this is this is a genius mind. This is somebody whose mind's racing and and what have you. And so it is interesting to see how people perceive things. But I always think it's fascinating when somebody has something that they're like, yeah, subconsciously, you know what? This tripped me up once or this got to me once. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you one thing that always gives me a favorable impression of somebody early on. And somebody could argue whether this is subconscious or not. But this is most basic and, again, fully admitting that this is no indicator of whether the person is, like, ethical or what have you. Just It's something I appreciate. A firm handshake and good eye contact still always get me. Just basic principles of being, like, a human being and trying to connect. But, of course, what do we know? Some people that are really good at those things, 
you know, they can play that to the hilt, but I still, a, a good handshake and eye contact get a long way with me as well as remembering my name, you know, and, and it is that Dale Carnegie principle. There's no sweeter sound for me. It's just more of like, you want to feel like somebody's paying attention and gives a shit. You know what I mean? So those are basic things for me. Does that bring any ideas up? Well, the name remembering thing is, has always been a big one for me because we'd be at these expos or meets or something, you know, at the Arnold sports festival, we might have, 5,000 people that we meet in three days and to, to use the person's name in that, you know, 30 second interaction, I know goes, it goes a really long way for, for people by the end of the weekend. Do I remember you know, person 30 out of 3000? Probably not, but you know, at least asking them, you know, is that, can I take a picture? And a lot of times they don't introduce themselves even, but to ask them, you know, what's, what's your name and then say it one or two more times in the, thing I know goes a long way. The firm handshake, one of the first things my dad taught me as a, a kid on the firm handshake, I, I definitely agree. It's it's not a sign that they're for sure going to be good, but if it, if it was dead fish, you know, like pudding hand, <laughs> major, major red flags. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And you mentioned that you were doing jujitsu. This is a two-part question. One, I'd love to know what got you into that, how long you've been practicing. And then two, and this is a totally selfish question, but in all the years that I taught athletes, teach athletes, what have you, I remember, you know, you learn a good about a good bit about movement principles and what have you, especially from some mentors that taught me teaching speed, agility, whatever, but nothing taught me more about movement and the true display of force in really a useful way than combatives, right? I think boxing, man, you know, I got better at teaching athletes. I don't care if it was football, soccer, rugby, what have you, cutting angles, techniques, hip position, all that. Uh, it, it took on a completely new light, despite my biomechanics knowledge and everything else after I had gotten into boxing, you know, cause it just, you, you understand these things. And I think also it made me more, um, open to some of the quote unquote things that we say is bullshit to our athletes when, Oh, lifting makes me stiff, you know, but when I've lifted and then I have an intense sparring session, you know, at some point, you know, it's like, all right, if I can stand back and be an objective here, I get it. I get why some fighters always felt like getting stronger made them stiff and slow, even though we know in context in the bigger picture, that's not it. Talk to me a little bit about what, how jujitsu compared to your powerlifting background, what are some things that it taught you about the application of force and tension and leverage that, that maybe they fed each other, helped each other, or even took away some of the things that you thought you knew from, from powerlifting? Yeah, so jujitsu uh, has really helped me understand two two things a lot better. Better quantifying athleticism, uh, where it's very simple for coaches to measure athleticism, you know, with a stopwatch, a, a vertex, a tape measure, a, a barbell. And I've been coaching jujitsu guys for eleven years now. Oh, you coach? And, yeah, uh, strength and conditioning. Ah, years. got it. okay, got it. So. You know, eight, nine, ten years ago, I'm coaching these guys who are world champion, black belt world champions in jiu-jitsu. And I'm like, you know, none of the jiu-jitsu guys are like that athletic because they couldn't, you know, they they ran like they were having an epileptic seizure. Like uh, they weren't that strong in in the barbell lifts, they couldn't jump that high, anything like that, compared to even my high level high school football guys. Yeah. But you know, the the way that they can organize their body in space and you know, contract and relax. And, and it's just a, a totally different that that rhythm, relaxation, coordination is really what athleticism is. Ha putting the output, you know, the output of someone who can run fast, jump high, generate a lot of force with that. That's when you have, you know, a phenom. Uh, so it's definitely helped that. And then the, the concept of, of special strength, um, you know, this afternoon I'll go. I'll go train with our our head professor, uh, who's been a black belt for 14 years now. He's 30, 35, been a black belt for 14 years, which is about as long as you could be. He's 175 pounds, maybe deadlifts 370, benches you know 225. But when he grabs me and when he does the stuff, like he's gonna feel way stronger than me, who's yeah 170 bench 570, and you know, the, the special strength idea from like Bondarchuk and that, that was something I started to understand from throwing that there were guys who could throw far, even though they couldn't, you know, squat that much or clean that much. They just had this ability to put 
force into an implement. And it was you know, tied to that rhythm, relaxation, timing, all that type of stuff. And then it was just repetition, like from the same standpoint that you could have a manual labor worker that, that you know, a, a mechanic is gonna be able to turn a wrench a lot stronger than even a you know, world-class power lifter may be able to do these jiu-jitsu guys who have just years and years and years of these same movements that they understand how to, you know, I, I'd say that, that technique is what allows you to express your strength so that, that they're able to, you know, where, where I'm taking my strength and just spraying it, in, you know, indiscriminately all, all over the place, they're taking their much lower general strength and focusing it as, as precisely as possible. So that understanding of special strength has has been really interesting and and trying to quantify some of that that like weird grappler strength that you can't measure it with a barbell no. in the traditional sense. It's like isometric, eccentric, you know, weird yielding kind of stuff. And and then you know you can really just quantify it as special, special strength, like the ability to express force through their sporting movement. Yeah, we just called it, you know, growing up in Nebraska, we just call it farm boy strength. Yeah. You know, uh, we grew up in Omaha and our cousins from Iowa would just whoop our ass. And it was a different level. You know, even when you started weight training, you're like, yeah, well, you're not throwing hay barrels and doing all this every day. And the dynamic resistance of, you know, they were hog farmers and stuff as well. Like there's no implement that can mimic that. Although I'm sure somebody's selling one in some magazine. That's, that's what we'll do next, man. We'll just, you know what I mean? Like farm boy strong. Let's go ahead and trade market right now. You and me 50, 50, and we'll start creating implements that look like farm animals. And you know, like everybody can be a farm boy now. We got it. Uh, no, I think that's a clear, I think that's a super clear description uh, of those things. And has, have you found, you know, the day when you walked into it and I think I know the answer here, but I still want to dig cause you and I are still getting to know one another. The day you walked into uh, just you practicing jujitsu for the first time, white belt, like never, it's your first time on a mat, are you, gi, no gi, you know, which one do you? Mostly training the gi. Okay. You're on that mat. It's your first day. Do you ever get, you know, fish out of water? Kind of, I mean, of course you're anxious to learn, but do you ever like, oh God, I feel like a jackass still? Yeah, uh, definitely. And it was, there was extra, beyond the expectations I, I would have placed on myself just from a history of very successful athletic endeavors pretty much my whole life. You know, if we back up 10 years, when I, 10, 11 years, when I first started training jiu-jitsu guys, they're all coming straight from Brazil, moving to Southern California, opening their jiu-jitsu schools. And I've got, you know, at some point, 12, 15 black belts. One's a six-time world champion. One's a three-time world champion. And there was, oh, good shit. Come on, man. You got to train. You're going to smash everybody. And, you know, I do a little bit of stuff with them here or there. Then we go to 2017. I'm a year post my last powerlifting meet, a year that I haven't really trained very much of anything. You know, so I'm still huge. I'm like 365. So I'm not near as strong as I was a year prior to that. And that's, you know, I guess all a, a thing of perspective. I could still squat like 750, but when you were doing 950, you're like, man, I'm so weak right now. <laughs> the, uh, so now I've got 10 years of, of buildup of, oh, come on, Coach Shed, you're going to smash everybody uh, with all this athletic history. And then I'm showing up and I'm really out, like in some of the worst shape I'd ever been in when I first started, started jujitsu. And I'm, our head professor is someone I've known for 10 years. He was one of those guys telling me that I was going to smash everybody. And I walk in and he's, Hey, coach Chad, what's up? And, and everyone's looking like, why is professor Philippe calling this fat, no stripe white belt coach Chad? You know, why is he calling him coach? Like, so the, the expectations were just mounting. And then as I'm wheezing through the, uh, through the warm up, you know, it was, uh, it, it was many, many blows to my, to my ego <laughs> the whole process. And just, you know, it will probably be more in two hours when I'm training again, but yeah, it's, it's been a ton of fun. It's, it's been so fun too, to be, to be relatively unknown uh, and, and like a total beginner. Cause if I go to the powerlifting meet, everyone wants to talk and oh, can you watch this video on my squat? And I go to jiu-jitsu. No one, no one even knows what powerlifting is. Isn't that nice? So, yeah. Yeah. Outside of uh, you know a couple times where someone recognized me from powerlifting and they were into that too, and they they asked for a picture, and then their I could hear their friend whispering in the background like, "What? Why, why does Jimmy want a picture with his white belt?" Yeah, <laughs> and I was got a good good laugh out of that. But 
yeah, it's incredible, incredible sport, incredible community. Well, and it kind of leads into what I was going to say next, and I'm glad to use the term white belt again is, you know, we, we do a lot of kind of looking at the messy realities of leadership. And uh, there's so many coaches that feel like they have to fit some standard of what a good coach is and how they need to coach. And we kind of talked about that a little earlier. Um, but you know, we spend so much time focusing on leadership and coaching that very rarely do we look at like the followers or the lead or the people that are other stakeholders in that. And we tend to forget that like everybody that's a leader in one context is a follower or whatever term you want to use. The literature uses follower, right? Like I'd say stakeholder in another one. And we forget that like, if we don't embrace that, man, it's just, it's a really easy way to like start depersonalizing yourself to everybody else. If you only want to be kind of veiled in the uh, armor of expertise and you only go to situations or you only go uh, seek uh, experiences where you just get a B, right? The expert and everything, it just gets lame. It gets really lame. And I know for me, one thing that led to some interesting content that I created once is I had to learn at some point, I was, I'm naturally a Southpaw when I box or when I strike. Right. But I ended up having a sports hernia surgery in like 2009 from like a, a predisposition, a, a weakness that I had. And so in boxing and all the rotation and the twisting just exposed that. So I ended up now switching to orthodox. And I remember the first time I'd ever gotten trained as an orthodox fighter. I mean, this was like, I mean, don't quote me 2013, 2015. And again, it just makes you reconceptualize the way that you individualize anything that you do going forward because you're back at it now. This You don't have that unconscious competence. And the minute you have an athlete that struggles, whether it's, hey, understanding how to apply tension, understanding how to take a certain angle, you now can, can put that in there. My question is this, where do you go now when you get the time? And let's imagine it's not a COVID world, right? Let's imagine it's not a COVID world. Other than jujitsu, where can you still go to feel like a beginner? Like where can you still go to really kind of get a dose of, of good humility, right? And something that kind of allows you to reconnect with that. Uh, golf. Oh, and okay. Definitely golf. Yeah. The, uh, though I played, you know, for most of my, my life, I had a, about a 10 year hiatus, uh, while I was powerlifting and, you know, when you're 365, it's a bit tough to <laughs> and swinging clubs. So coming back after that, it was like, you know, I'm swinging in a new body compared to when I was 17. And, uh, yeah, that's just, I mean, anyone who plays golf knows that even for the best guys, it's still the most frustrating, you know, infuriating game that there, there can be. So that's been a, a really fun thing for, for the last you know, year and a half to get, to get back into that, where it gives me kind of new perspective on, on some sport performance and coaching ideas, because it is so technical. There's so much sports psychology to it because it gives you so much time to think about every little action that you are, are going to do. Uh, but it's something that, you know, I switching from shot put to powerlifting, uh, that was a pretty smooth, natural transition. Powerlifting the strong man, pretty smooth, natural tra transition where, uh, you know, powerlifting to jujitsu and powerlifting to golf, they, they don't help. They don't help that much. So yeah. it's, it's been, uh, yeah, it's, it's been fun to just get to kind of start at the bottom. Yeah. The indirect, I think we forget sometimes that the indirect, you know, in so many ways leads back to what we're trying to directly impact. It just, it troubles me that, you know, you look at a lot of stuff in the performance side of things. There's, there's not a lot of outputs that coaches can go to with conferences to still feel like a beginner that don't get them away from the barbell or the practice field or whatever, you know, and, and selfishly that's like, what we're trying to create with what we do with a lot of our apprenticeship, which by the way, we still got to get you out to one at some point you got to come. And, uh, but it is important to feel like a novice. It's important to kind of go out because you just lose your connection and how can you individualize any sense of your coaching, you know, and, and within that you growing juggernaut, you doing everything with the app, you, you having, how many people do you have on staff? Uh, coaches, eight coaches, three web developers, to two full-time customer service people. And every day, does that take you having to interact and guide and direct them? You know, do you have it fairly automated? Uh, what's your process like with team meetings and how you guys manage the product and, you know, the day-to-day -day coaching of your team, so to speak, in this context? Yeah, you know, I probably don't do as good a job of that as I, as I should uh, because I've, you know, very rarely been an employee uh, in, any, in any sense. I... I have a hard time, I think, grasping the full depth of, of how much leadership people need because I've always myself just been like, well, 
this is what I'm supposed to do. So I just do it all on my, on my own. But uh, yeah, at, th at this point, the people that I communicate with the most frequently are certainly our, our web developers as, as we, you know, continue to, to work on new aspects of Dragon AI app. Um, our coaches, we typically have a weekly meeting with that, whether it's a coaching development, which we'll do from, you know, a lot of different perspectives or just, you know, trying to find out areas that I can, you know, better help them do their job. Uh, and the customer service people, then I, if there's something going wrong, then I, then I hear from them. <laughs> yeah. Is there an area that you find yourself particularly deficient in that kind of frustrates you? And I, I'll give you an example of my own. If that, if that helps, you know, we typically run our team meetings on Tuesdays and that can vary, right? But we have to do it across a, a few different time zones. And, um, I can very much confuse the urgent with the important, even though I, I have certain fail safes that I know I should not have that happen. But let's say, you know, there's just something that isn't going quite the way that we want it to. Uh, maybe there's an issue with the web page. Maybe there's an issue with a sign up process not being simple, you know, whatever. And I'll tend to go into the meeting, even though we know we want to handle some old business, some new business, very methodical, stay on point. I'll just launch into a stream of consciousness of wanting like what we need to do to fix it. And I'll have to pull myself back sometimes, but I think I'm also just, some of it comes from the insecurity of not wanting to forget. You know, if we get into the meeting and I'm really listening to people, I'll forget. And then I'll get frustrated later because I know to the next thing. So despite everything I know about communication and good listening and patience, and which is definitely suffering disguises a virtue, um, sometimes I'll just steamroll the team meeting. Yeah, and, and I won't do that when I'm consulting with people, right? When people hire me, I can shut the hell up and wait my turn and, and what have you. But is there anything that you're just like, God, I need to, this particular thing from a communication standpoint gets me. You know, I, I don't consider myself to be a, a very good manager o overall as I look, you know, at my role and uh, the, that role that I have to fulfill. And probably most of that stems from not making my expectations of people clear enough up, up front. You know, that, that's something that I struggle with. And I think it is because I've never felt like people need to do that with me, that I was, I understood the task and I was, you know, going to fulfill it to the best of my ability or probably beyond their expectation anyways. So it never became a thing of like, well, you didn't do this how I, how I expected. So that, that I think is the area for me where I need to be a lot better with my team and rather than assuming they understand what my expectations are, which is to match the level that I would do the same job at, uh, that I need to communicate that more clearly and, and sooner to them. So then with juggernaut AI, right? The coaching component of that, how involved with, are you like you actually Chad on there in terms of the interactive nature of it, or is that mainly the coaches that you employ or is there no live direct interaction, right? Like if our viewers, and we're going to share the links for everything, but our viewers, if they wanted to kind of visualize like, yeah, I want some guidance here. Uh, am I talking to a person? Like, how do you manage that? Yeah. So the, the AI app is generating programs completely autonomously and it's making adjustments to those programs that are frankly far beyond what any human coach. Yeah. It's super could. cool. It's definitely cutting edge. And, uh, you know, the in-person interaction with that is, is just like a, we just use a private Facebook group for that right now. And they're posting videos and answering questions, but we've had people who have gone through, you know, 1.0, 2.0, and now into the, to the app of it, who they know, it, they know every answer to all the beginners questions and do a really good job of answering them for me. So that's, that's nice. And I can kind of just, you know, pop in, I usually go in there like an hour every morning and just, you know, reply to as many videos and as many questions as I can scroll through in that hour. Uh, but for the most part, it's all, it's all about the existing content we have, you know, from a lifting standpoint, I was going to joke that if someone has a question about lifting, I have a video that answers it. And I probably do uh, if they're doing powerlifting or weightlifting. So, you know, we just have that built out so effectively and even AI, you know, search systems for that, that help them find what they're looking for with a couple of keywords. Yeah, no. Well, I think it's super cool. And you've been a, you've been a good sport, man. I, I, uh, we always try to keep these shows unscripted, you know, and I, I try to 
pepper guest with a good mix of what I know. You know, like we want we want to be able to celebrate all the things and, and, and cool stuff that you've done. But my goal is also to get you smile, laugh a little bit, maybe get one question that stumps you. And I just, you know, I appreciate you coming on and I wanted to return the favor with everything that you've always been super supportive. I think one thing I've never had a chance to tell you face to face, or in this case, artificially face to face is there are a lot of people on that, that really fixate on the training side of things, which I'm still very much passionate about that when I started doing my own thing kind of got threatened. You know, you were always very supportive, cool. You know, you get the path, you get that people are supposed to evolve. You understand the importance of playing the long game. And uh, just from uh, one coach that's trying to evolve the best I can to another one that I have a lot of respect for, you know, I want to thank you. And I definitely want everybody that listens to check your stuff out, whether they're, you know, staying at home and haven't lifted or trained seriously in a long time, or there's somebody that has been in something intensive. And so please, by all means, man, like share, share links. We'll put it in the bio. Where can they go to support you and, and everything Juggernaut's doing? Thanks, Brett. Uh, it really means a lot. And, you know, I, I really admire the stuff that, that you're doing as well, because it's, it's the really hard part of coaching. Understanding the training uh, is kind of simple in the, in the grand scheme, but but the people and personalities is is a constantly evolving challenge. Uh, if they want to find more Juggernaut stuff, jtsstrength.com is our website. The Juggernaut AI app in uh, for the Apple App Store or Google Play Store, they can find that. And then at Juggernaut Training, at Chad Wesley Smith on Instagram, Juggernaut Training Systems. YouTube, uh, 300,000 plus subscribers on there. It's amazing. I said, if you got a question about how to pick up uh, heavy stuff, I probably got an answer on there for you. <laughs> I love it, man. And, and it's funny because it, it, that's, it's an incredible amount of content you put out, yet I'm sure you still get the questions like, what book should I read? What exercise should I do? And you're like, please, for the love of God, just go to, go to what I've created over a decade. You know, I, I think that there was a time where I would get so frustrated by it. I, I, there must be some kind of cycle because now, now I'm just like, just find the link and shoot it off. Yeah. I, could, I could get annoyed by it. And now my, you know, this part of my giant head is just a, a database of existing juggernaut content and I just fire the article off to them instantly. A hundred percent, man. Well, thank you again and, and give Marissa my best. It was a pleasure meeting her whenever I'm around her. And, and guys, uh, Brett Bartholomew, Chad Wesley Smith, signing off. Thanks so much for joining us for this conversation. 